I'm going to ask you if you would take your Bibles while you remain standing for just a moment. Turn to the Old Testament book of 2 Chronicles chapter 7. We're going to look at a very familiar passage today. Here's one thing I know. I know that the word of the Lord is true no matter what the circumstances of life dictate. That's right. I know that God's word is still true. I, uh, I was having a discussion a number of years ago with somebody, and they were talking about some of the uh, out-of-balance teaching and preaching that had gone on with regard to prosperity. And I said, I said, if it's truth, if it is God's truth from His Word, it doesn't matter what country you're in, it will preach and it will still be true. And if you can't preach it in third world countries, you don't need to be preaching it in first world countries. I thought I'd get a bigger amen out of you than that, but that's okay. It's still the truth. So the Word of the Lord is still true regardless of what the circumstances of life dictate. So I don't know who this will be for today, but in the midst of all that's just happened and the heavy that I laid on you earlier, I want to tell you God's word is still true, and he still has a word to speak to us today. Second Chronicles chapter 7, let's begin reading at verse 12. Let's read together. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon at night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. If I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, and my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, Then I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. The day had been a resounding success. After seven years of construction, the majestic temple stood gleaming in the early morning light. The dedication service was an extravagant outpouring of devotion to the Lord, as 22,000 oxen and 120,000 sheep were sacrificed during the ceremony of consecration. The most skilled Levitical singers and instrumentalists were present. They praised the Lord with song, with music of cymbals, harps, and lyres, and 120 priests blowing shofars. As they praised and worshiped the Lord, the Bible says that the glory of the Lord filled the house and there was such a powerful manifestation of his presence until the priests were so overwhelmed they couldn't stand and minister. At the climax of the service, King Solomon stood and offered a prayer of dedication. In addition to invocation and petition, his prayer resonated with the voice of the prophet. In prayer, Solomon looked past the peace and prosperity that was being enjoyed at that time by the nation. He looked into a time when Israel might be in trouble, into a time when the nation would turn away from following the Lord with heartfelt devotion. In his prayer, he included those people who might be turned away from God. He prayed that if they turned toward the temple, it would be an indication of the posture of their hearts that they were turning their hearts back to the Lord. He prayed that if they just looked in the direction of the temple and prayed, that even though they couldn't physically get to the house of God, that God would be merciful and would bring his hand of divine blessing and help to their lives. After the celebration and dedication was concluded and the people returned to their homes, Solomon retired to his bed for the evening. That's the setting for the verses that form the text for the message today. That night, 
the Lord appeared to Solomon. In his dream, the Lord let him know that he was pleased with the dedication and he was willing to grant the petition Solomon had made. When you look then at verse 14, you find here that the promise spoken by the Lord in this verse is just as relevant to the people of God today as it was when it was first given. During this month of January, I've been talking to you about effective praying. I began by talking about the pattern for prayer that the Lord Jesus gave to his followers. Last week, I talked to you about persistence in prayer, praying and not giving up no matter what pressures and what obstacles present themselves. Today, I want to turn your attention to another component that is important for your prayer to be effective. That component is what I call prevailing prayer, and it's found here in verse 14 of the text. If you want the overcoming, if you want the rejoicing, if you want a release from bondage and a restoration of life and a return to meaningful purpose, if you want to see the turnaround, then the first thing you need to do is remember your position. Notice when the Lord responds to Solomon's prayer, how many times he says, my, my people, my name, my face. See, this kind of praying and this kind of answer to prayer isn't for those who are out of fellowship and relationship with the Lord. The promise of help and victory and blessing and life and restoration, it's only given to those who are the people of God. See, one of the most important things you can do today and this week and through the remainder of this year and for the rest of your life is remember your position. You are the people of God. Too many, I've found, have bought into the lies of the enemy. Too many have believed the negatives and forgotten who you really are. See, you're part of a family that isn't based on race or culture. It isn't based on position. It isn't based on accomplishments. It isn't based on possessions. It isn't based on personality. You became part of this family I'm talking about by the blood of Jesus, by believing in his name and surrendering the control of your life to him. That means you've been born again. You've been adopted into the family of God. Through faith in Jesus, you've been given the right and the authority to become a child of God. Now, I don't know if you realize this or not, but the reason you're part of this family of God isn't because you woke up one morning and decided that would be a good thing for you to do. But you're part of God's family because God wanted you. He chose you. You didn't choose him. He chose you. Think about it. This great God of the universe wants you. That's why the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, that you are a chosen generation. You're a royal priesthood. You, he's made you a holy nation. You're a people for God's own possession so that you might show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. I tell you, as a child of God, you're no longer under the dominion of sin. Instead, you're protected and you're sheltered by the heavenly father. If the storms of life begin to blow up around you, you remember that you are his people. You're the sheep of his pasture. You remember that you are in the father's hands and and nothing can pluck you out of his hand. When you face adversity, you remember that he that is within you is greater than he that is in the world. You remember that you are more than a conqueror through him who loved you. You remember that the Lord is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand blameless in the presence of his glory with great joy. I'm telling you today, you may be surrounded by unbelievers. You may be under great pressure. You may have incredible obstacles in your path, but don't you ever believe believe the lies of the devil. Don't you ever believe the prevailing wisdom of this age. You're not like everybody around you in the marketplace. God has his hand on you. There's royal blood flowing in your veins. There's a seal of the Holy Spirit upon your heart. There's a crown of righteousness waiting for you at the end of your days. You're a child of the king. You're an heir of God and you're a joint heir with Jesus Christ. It's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. You're 
past doesn't control your future. God holds your future in his hands. I tell you, you're not lost, you're found. You're not doomed to perish in sin, you're saved. You're not going down to defeat, you're rising up in victory. You're not guilty, you're forgiven. You're not bound, you're free. You're not in debt, you're redeemed. You're not condemned, you're pardoned. I'm telling you today, you're not on the road to hell, you're on the highway to heaven. Listen, 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 listen. The stock, the stock market may be volatile, but you're still in his hands, and you're still his child. The courts may not rule in your favor, but you're still his child. Crime may be rampant in the streets, but you're still his child. The virus may not have a cure, but you are still his child. The whole world may be against you, but you're still his child. Oh, I wish somebody would just start to remember your position. You're a child of the king. Go ahead and praise him if you know you're a child of the king today. The next component about prevailing prayer in this passage is the need to respond in obedience. Sometimes we wish he hadn't put that there, but it's, it's there, so we've got to deal with it. The Lord said to Solomon, watch this, if my people who are called by my name, that's, that's our position, but watch this, he said, humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. So not only is it important for you to remember who you are as the people of God, but it's also important that you respond in obedience to his voice and his will and his ways. The way of prevailing prayer is the way of humility. The way of prevailing prayer is recognizing that there must be someone beyond yourself and your own ability that gives the resource of help. The way of prevailing prayer is seeking the face of God, abiding in His presence, focusing on Him, putting Him first in your life. The way of prevailing prayer is the way of repentance, turning from your wicked way. One of the big reasons prayers aren't answered any more than they are is because of the omission of this key ingredient of obedience. As far as I can tell, there really aren't any shortcuts. I, I know how it is. You would rather get a quick and easy, painless answer. You want to come down here and have somebody lay hands on you and you get zapped and suddenly have wonderful things begin to flow. You want to continue down the road you want to travel, doing what you want to do just the way you want to do it and still get the favor and the blessing of the Lord. I'm so glad y'all shouted on the first point. In my more than 38 years of being a lead pastor, I've seen this play out over and over again. You come to the Lord with your life all messed up. You come to an altar of prayer and you receive his help and you get on a productive path. <laughs> and then you go back and do the same thing you did before. And you wonder why your life gets all messed up again. Well, listen, it isn't all that difficult to figure out. If you keep doing what you've always done, you'll keep getting what you've always gotten. You want the glory, you want the victory, you want the blessing, but God rarely works according to your time schedule. Anybody figured that out yet? And he rarely works according to your plan, and he rarely works according to your formula and your program. If you're going to experience the work of God, then you're going to have to humble yourself and say, Lord, my plan isn't good enough. My way isn't going to work. I need your way, I need your will, I need your timing. Prevailing prayer means that you're willing for the Holy Spirit to shine his searchlight into your heart. You invite him to in to reveal any area where you are in opposition to the will and the way of the Almighty. Then you repent. That means you go the opposite way you've been heading. And you respond in obedience to the prompting of the Holy Spirit to go God's way. The blessing and the favor 
and the help and the victory, they all come in response to the obedience. See, it's a conditional statement. If my people humble, pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear, I will forgive, I will heal. (laughs) People want to ignore God's plan and then they seem confused when their life gets messed up. It's not that great a mystery. You travel your own path, you'll get what you can do. You travel God's path, you'll receive what he can do. There, there are people connected to this church. You've heard the word of the Lord taught and preached for years. You aren't ignorant. You know the right path to follow. But you're blatantly ignoring God's way and doing what you want to do instead of what he says to do. Now, I love you. That's why I'm preaching like this. I love you. But don't look so surprised when you ignore God's God's plan and God's path, and then you wind up in trouble. Don't try to blame your parents, or your job, or the church, or your pastor, or God, or anybody else for the problem you're having. It's on you. The ones who walk in the blessing are the ones who walk in obedience to the will of the Lord. You know, sometimes when people talk about needing God's help, it comes across as if what they need is a, is a booster shot from God. You know, they're really doing pretty good. They just need a little extra oomph from God to get them over the hump. What you fail to understand is that you are totally dependent upon him. The work you're able to do, it's because he enables. The praise you speak, he gives so it can be returned to him. The food you eat, He provides. The very breath you breathe, He supplies. What you need isn't just a little extra oomph. What you need is an infusion of His power and His help. 60 seconds of every minute, 60 minutes of every hour, 24 hours of every day, 7 days of every week, 4 weeks of every month, 12 months of every year, each and every year for your entire existence upon this planet. If you want divine favor and blessing, stop relying on your own ingenuity. Stop depending on your own strength. Humble yourself. Pray. Seek the face of the Lord. Turn from your wickedness that is in opposition to his righteousness and holiness. Respond in obedience to the word and the will of the Lord. You've got to remember your position. You've got to respond in obedience. Then there's the third part of this prevailing prayer that makes praying effective. And that is rejoice in the results. Look at the promise. Then I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. You remember your position, you respond in obedience, and God promises, I will heal your land. And understand, this isn't just a promise for a group of people or for a nation in the Old Testament. This is something you can personalize. When you follow God's plan, then God's promise is for you. He says to you, I will heal your land. I will heal that place in your life that is broken. I will bring restoration and wholeness to your life. I will pour out divine favor and blessing on your life, in your home on your family, on your job, on your church, and even in your nation. See, it isn't dependent upon which political party is in power. It isn't dependent upon who sits in the Oval Office in the White House. It isn't dependent upon the amount of tenure you have on your job. It isn't dependent upon the opinion of your peers. This is a divine decree by the Almighty that cannot be nullified by the mandates of men. When God determines to bless you with divine favor, there aren't enough demons in hell that can overturn his decree. A little over 23 years ago, I was trying to make a decision about whether or not to leave where I was serving at that time as a pastor to come to Jacksonville to this church. I was torn. I didn't, I didn't really want to leave. 
they weren't trying to get rid of me, trying to make me leave. I was comfortable. I enjoyed it. I, things were going well. God was blessing. God was moving. And I was like, God, I'm, 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 really, I'm really torn here. I don't know how to do this. What do you want? And here's what the Lord said to me. Which one you want to do? I said, well, if I had my druthers, <laughs> I'd rather just stay put and leave, leave that whole, you know, forget those people in Northeast Florida. And God says, I'm putting before you. And then he started showing me and, and directing me. I don't have time to tell you the whole story. It's way too long and, and, and involved. That this was the prefer, preferred path for him, that he wanted me to go. But here's what he said to me. And I took great comfort in this because I was stepping into an area I had absolutely no idea what I was getting myself into. And nobody knew what I was doing either. They, my, all my friends told me I was crazy. But God said to me, it, it was just as clear as, as, as if we were having a conversation, though I heard no audible voice. But he spoke to my heart and said, I've decided to bless you. He said, you can stay where you are, and I've decided I'm going to bless you. I'd rather you go here. And if you'll do that, I've decided to bless you. Either way, I'm going to bless you. Who can go wrong with that when God says, I'm going to bless you? Now, I got to tell you, for the first two or three years when I was here, the blessing of the Lord looked a little strange. <laughs> but I look back over these 23 years and I say, yes, God has richly blessed me. He has not failed to honor the promise he made to me. I'm a blessed man because God said, I'm going to bless you. See, See, when God determines to bless you with divine favor, nobody, 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 nobody can stop the blessing of the Lord. And the blessing comes when you walk in the obedience to his will and his way. So I'm convinced one of the reasons you don't experience more of the miracle working of God is because you don't really expect it. Sometimes you don't expect it because you're confused about your position. You're confused about who you are in Jesus. Sometimes you don't expect it <laughs> because you know you haven't been walking in obedience. Sometimes you don't expect it simply because your vision is too narrow. It's too small. See, it's so easy to get focused on trying to find the solution to the problem that looms so big in your mind until you forget that while you're preoccupied with your little world, it is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. What I'm trying to help you see is that when you put yourself in a position where you're, you are in agreement with the word and the will of God, at that point, you're in a position where you can receive God's blessing and provision. You are positioned in alignment with his word and his will. And you need, when you are positioned like that, you need to begin to expect the fulfillment of his promise. And before you ever see the manifestation of that promise, you need to begin to rejoice in the promised result. When you begin to anticipate that God is going to show up, and when you have put yourself in a position to receive his promise, I'm telling you, he'll be there. And when he comes, he'll come with greater power, greater glory than anything you can possibly imagine. Because with him, it is always exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you can think or ask. Some of you are so concerned about the little inconveniences of your life. Some of you make mountains out of things that aren't of any consequence whatsoever in light of eternity. What difference is it going to make five years from now? What difference is it going to make next week? For most of it. And for goodness sake, what difference is it going to make in eternity? And you worry and you fret. You get frustrated. 
you even get angry because of these things. Why don't you let go of them and let God take care of them? That may be the best advice somebody's gotten all week long. Just let go of that and let God take care of it. Why don't you begin to expect that God is going to come into your life in a powerful way and he's going to bring you into a dimension of his glorious presence that you haven't even dared to imagine? See, I wish I had somebody who would begin to believe and to expect that God is going to show up in your home and save your unsaved spouse. Somebody needs to expect that God is going to bring his miracle of healing to your body. Somebody needs to expect that God is going to bring his miracle of provision to your need. Somebody needs to expect that God is going to turn your church upside down and right side out so that it will never again be church as usual, but it will be a new wave and a fresh move of the Spirit of God in the midst of his people. Somebody ought to start rejoicing in the promise of God before you ever see its fulfillment. When you start living a life of prevailing prayer, you can begin to anticipate that when we gather for worship, the glory of God is going to come down. Somebody's going to get saved, and somebody's going to get healed, and somebody's going to be delivered, and somebody's going to be commissioned for kingdom service, and somebody's going to be strengthened, and somebody's going to be encouraged, and somebody's going to be restored, and somebody's going to be made whole. People who live this lifestyle of prevailing prayer come together with the anticipation that today will be the day of breakthrough. Today will be the time of visitation of the Spirit of God. People who live this lifestyle of prevailing prayer wake up with the anticipation that yes, this could be the day when the trumpet will sound and the dead in Christ will rise and the church will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and we shall be with him for all eternity. The help you need is going to come as you live the lifestyle of prevailing prayer. Your prayers will be effective as you remember your position, as you respond in obedience and rejoice in the results. Now I want to pray with you. I want to lift your needs to the Lord. Before I ask you to respond to an invitation, I want you to think about your expectations. What is it that you not only want the Lord to do, but what is it you anticipate God will do? See, sometimes we pray, oh Lord, I want you to do this, I want you to do that, but we really don't think anything's going to happen. That's true, Pastor. They just will not respond to that, but it's still true. What do you anticipate God's going to do about this? Maybe the Lord is speaking something about this area of obedience to you. So there might be some repentance the Lord is calling for in your life. Some way where, some place where you know you're not walking the way he wants you to walk. Maybe what you need to hear is just the encouragement of the Lord. He wants to bring that to your life today so that you'll remember your position. You'll remember that you really are his child. Maybe, just maybe, God is calling for you to pray an audaciously big prayer. A prayer that would be a demonstration when he answers it of his great power and his great love for one of his children. What is it that you need God to do, but you've hesitated to ask because it's like, oh, that's just, that's just too much. Would you honor God by praying a prayer that you think is too big for him so that he can prove that there's nothing too hard for him? Whatever it is that you need, when we pray, you need to, you need to think about your expectation. Expect God to hear and answer your prayer today. 
Expect God to bring encouragement. Expect God to bring deliverance. Expect God to forgive. Expect God to give direction. Expect God's glory to be revealed. Expect today that you will be made whole.